Okay, well, as Stephen mentioned, um, middle way philosophy is my, is my life's work and passion. Um, and uh, middle way philosophy, particularly, is for me, it's something that includes the insights I get from Buddhism, but it's also something wider. Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's practically focused, but it also tries to be intellectually rigorous, and it also um, draws on a wide variety of sources. So I also am very engaged with philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, systems theory, for instance, as uh, sources of understanding. Um, so, so what I often try to do is to synthesize, to bring together different perspectives in my work. So um, I'm going to talk about provisionality. Um, and I mean, this has been part of my understanding of middle way philosophy for some years. So um, as I've um, gradually brought it into focus from you know, about the last 20 years or so I've been working on middle way philosophy in a series of books. Uh, and I think it was maybe about 10 years ago I started to develop what are now known as the five principles. So I began to formulate, uh, sort of crystallise some ideas about what I thought the middle way was about, um, what I thought um, the path as, in a, as universal a formulation as we could manage, drawing on different sources. Um, what it would involve. Uh, so those five principles of the middle way, I'm not going to talk about all of them now, but I'll just mention the five. Um, so there's scepticism, provisionality, incrementality, agnosticism, and integration. Uh, so I could happily talk about any of those <laughs> for an hour, but I'm going to focus just on provisionality. And any of those, really, any of those five for me, provide a way in to thinking about the middle way. And the middle way for me is, is very much about judgment. That is how we respond to things at one moment or the next. Yes, so, so at each uh, <clears throat> new moment, we have a new opportunity to respond to things in a slightly different way from how we did before. Um, that's very much what provisionality is about and very much what the middle way is about, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm not so much focused on you know, ideal characters or uh, ideal sources or anything like that. I draw on a wide range of traditions, but I'm very interested in what it means to make helpful judgments. Yeah? So, so what's the best way to respond to things? Um, so provisionality. Uh, I better start with some sort of quick definition, though any, any definition is going to be limited. But I would say it's, it's the quality of being able to respond flexibly to new experience yeah. um, and to modify your beliefs in the light of new experience. So one of our characteristics as human beings, which we can understand in all sorts of ways, is that we tend to get stuck. Uh, so we develop some sort of view of things that's maybe fine in one particular situation, one context, but then things change and we don't adapt to a new situation, new context. We're stuck with the old beliefs. Um, so provisionality is what we need in order to be able to adapt and to change, uh, to make the most appropriate judgments in a new situation. Uh, and that means we have to not only be aware of new experience and be receptive to it, but also be able to incorporate it into our understanding and to, to act on it. Um, so now provisionality is a, is a word which kind of in theory uh, has existed for some time, I think. But I think I remember when I first typed it on a Word document, it came up with a little scribbly red underneath it, you know, because the, the, the uh, spell checker didn't recognise it. So uh, it's obviously not very widely used uh, as a noun, provisionality. I'm obviously provisional as a word which is often used. Um, but if you, could go, if you talk about being provisional in, in Ireland, for example, you could be misunderstood. But, um, 
but yeah, generally, generally people understand the idea of a you know, provisional booking or you know, provisional uh, view of something. Uh, but visionality then is just the, the noun made from that. It's talking about the, that quality uh, that we need to be able to be provisional. Um, and um, it's also, you could say particularly, it's where science and Buddhism meet, I think, or, or the insights you can get from both of them meet. Um, so I'm not a scientist, I'm much more of a philosopher, but I'm very interested in the methods of science and the, the ways that scientists approach things. Um, and um, it seems to me that um, what's most uh, helpful and indeed flexible in science is based on provisionality as a scientific value, yeah, as something that, you know, so, so a, a good scientist will probably approach their research with a theory in mind, which they're using to model what they're looking at and investigating. But at the same time, um, they will need to be open to the evidence contradicting what their model is. So they may need to change their view of things. And there are a few uh, ex you know, examples of scientists who have quite radically changed their views in the light of new evidence. And that's a really difficult thing to do, particularly if you've you know, invested 10 years or something in a, you know, researching a particular theory and then you find it's wrong because of, or, or, or you can no longer support it anyway. Um, and um, to do that, I think, depends on our mental states. It depends on how we respond to things. It's a psychological quality. And I don't usually find that scientists talk about that very much. Maybe, maybe there are exceptions to that. But, um, so they're much more prefer to talk about their method in rational terms about what they do with the evidence uh, rather than what they themselves, the states they themselves need to be in in order to make the right judgments about that evidence. Um, but it's definitely there in the scientific approach, I think. Um, but it's also there in Buddhism, and obviously one of my inspirations for provisionality is, is uh, from Buddhism. Um, the, there are a couple of f famous parables from the Buddha, um, which very much encapsulate provisionality for me. Uh, one of the most famous is the raft simile. Uh, so if you set off to cross the river, uh, you need to get across to the other side of the river and you build a raft and you take your raft across the river and then you get to the other side. So what do you do with the raft? Well, I said, you know, do, you, do you pick up the raft and carry it with you? Uh, in which case it will rapidly become a burden and it won't be much use to you on dry land, uh, or do you leave it there by the river? So the raft is, is, uh, could be any theory or belief that we are uh, attached to that, that has really, perhaps been really helpful to us in getting across the river in a particular circumstance. Um, but when you've got across the river, when you're in a new set of circumstances, you're going to need to change that view. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so that's one... Um, parable of the Buddha which, which is, uh, encapsulates provisionality. Another one is uh, the loot strings analogy. So in another, another passage in the Pali Canon, um, the Buddha talks about, or he's talking to a, um, an experienced musician, a monk who used to be a musician, about uh, the tuning of a lute and that the, the string, <coughs> as the musician recognises, shouldn't be too taut or too slack to be tuned correctly. And he talks about that particularly in relation to meditation and to how we should practice. Um, but you can also apply that to anything. Uh, so are your views too taut? Do you have too rigid an understanding of the thing you're working with? Or is it too slack? Do you, do you have um, too floppy a view which is uh, it's not robust enough to be examined and to think about consistently? Um, so provisionality um, requires us to hit that middle point of, of holding our beliefs strongly enough to be of practical use, um, but flexibly enough to be able to change when, when necessary and appropriate. And obviously judging when it's appropriate is a, is a key issue. Okay, so, so science and Buddhism, scientific method and Buddhism can provide two ways into provisionality. There are lots of others I'm not going to talk about in any detail, but just to mention, yeah, you could also see provisionality as 
unbiased thinking. Yeah? So if you're interested in bias and the psychology of bias, uh, you could also see provisionality uh, in neuroscientific terms as having a sufficient influence of the right hemisphere on the left, because it's a left hemisphere over dominance that tends to get us stuck in particular views. Uh, so if we're open to new experience in a way that can allow us to modify the view we hold in our left hemispheres, then um, that's, I think, how provisionality works. Or in systems theory, you can think about feedback loops and adjusting feedback loops. So we get into certain patterns and we tend to go round and round in the same ways of looking at things uh, and applying those ways of looking at things uh, and then looking for evidence that confirms what we already believe. Yeah, the sound is gone. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we tend to get stuck in those cycles, confirmation cycles, if you like. But uh, provisionality is about just being able to adjust those cycles, to be able to bring in some new experience, some new information to help us. Um, okay, but, but um, so that's just a bit of background, if you like, some ways you could approach provisionality. Um, but the main things I want to talk about today are, well, first of all, um, uh, a bit of um, an account of what I think provisionality is, what it involves, and secondly, how we can cultivate it, uh, so the practice of provisionality. Um, and then the practical side of it, I will follow through more this afternoon, so I'm holding a workshop in the Yom, I think it is, um, where uh, we'll actually do some stuff uh, about using provisionality in discussion. Yeah. So putting this into action. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a handout here, uh, which if somebody could hand it out for me, that'd be great. I'm not sure I've actually printed enough. Actually, I've underestimated the size of the audience. There's about 20 there, so you might need to share. Yes, yeah, so uh, if you look at the top of the handout when you get it, you'll see there's a little diagram uh, about uh, provisionality and its relationship to various other qualities. Um, and I think um, all of these can help us to understand really what it, what it involves. Um, so yeah, let me stop, start there at the top left hand corner uh, where it says complexity. Um, so the world is, or the universe is complex. There's all sorts of stuff going on in it um, that we're not aware of, that we don't know about. Um, so the result of that is uncertainty. Um, things are unpredictable. Um, and uh, well, that complexity, obviously, one, one way in which we're particularly encountering that at the moment uh, is the news that keeps greeting us about global warming and its effects, um, which people are going to find it very difficult to adapt to if they can do so at all. Um, so for a long time, we've been ignoring that complexity, that aspect of what's going on in, in the world. Um, so obviously that relates to how we, how we relate to that complexity. So, so uh, next to complexity there, you'll see one of the features of provisionality is adaptivity or resilience. Um, so if we are more provisional in our judgments, uh, then when new conditions come along, we're able to adapt. Now by adapt here, uh, broadly speaking, I mean continue to meet our needs, yeah? So I'm not talking about it just in a narrow sort of Darwinian way, so I don't just mean survive, although obviously we do need to survive um, or reproduce, but also to continue to meet our other needs. For example, uh, our needs for social support or our needs for uh, intellectual understanding or well, you know, whatever, however we understand our needs. Um, 
So uh, adaptivity is required to continue to meet those needs in different circumstances. Um, and um, we, we are able to do that because when we encounter new experiences, we are able to consider new options, new alternatives. So if you look at the next uh, little hexagon around the, the clock, as it were, so after adaptivity, there's optionality. Um, so optionality is having options, is having alternative possibilities that you can think about, that you can consider. Um, they're on your agenda in some way. And um, this can be very much a matter of imagination. Can you imagine alternative options? Uh, if you can imagine them, though, can you also consider them seriously? Uh, we'll, we'll think about what that involves in a minute. But, um, so, but very often, um, we're, if we're stuck, we tend to model everything that we see in terms of absolute views, yes and no. Um, so um, if you think about some particularly entrenched discussions or areas of discussion, maybe uh, whether God exists or uh, the debate about abortion perhaps, um, or perhaps uh, Republican versus Democrat arguments in the US. So, so they tend to get stuck in a duality of when you know, there's, there's either you're on one side or you're on the other, and those two sides are often associated strongly with two groups, and you, have to, you need to conform to belong to that group, and you're likely to react uh, to the alternative view as something very negative. Yeah? So, so that kind of pattern of there only being two options associated with two groups can constantly constrict our thinking. Um, and um, the way it does that is to just give us a yes or a no in effect. So, so any, any new complex bit of information just gets processed as one or the other. You know, either they're on our side, whoops, <laughs> um, or they're on their side. Yes, yeah? so, so either um, uh, you're in the group or you're out of the group. And you can almost, uh, maybe if you uh, watch yourself reacting to something you read on the internet, yeah, you can almost detect, I can certainly detect that moment where I think, oh, well, this this person, some sort of right winger, yeah? Um, and that's sort of the group think creeping in immediately, yeah? So rather than weighing up what this person is actually saying, I'm immediately putting them in a category which is opposed to the one I identify with. Um, so uh, optionality involves actually thinking about the alternatives, actually being aware of third options uh, other than the yes or the no, the with us or against us. Um, and uh, other ways of understanding that, uh, you know, is in terms of false dichotomy or dualism, for example. Um, there's a very famous example um, of George Bush Jr. Uh, at the time of the, um, I think it was the, maybe before the Second Gulf War, but he made this famous speech where he stood up and said, either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. Um, so so uh, you know, it's, a, it's a false dichotomy, it's a, it's a yes or no, where there are other possibilities. And usually there are other possibilities, you just have to look closely enough to find them. Uh, so, so that's the, often the challenge, to think beyond the framing that everybody may be using around you, which insists there's only two options. But very often there's more. Um, Okay, just go, so going further around the, the clock, as it were, from optionality, um, actually, uh, yeah, actually I'm going to jump a bit. I'll come back to probabilizing in a minute, but um, let's go to slowness. So as a quality of provisionality, um, slowing down is really important. Um, so one reason we need to be slower is so we don't jump to conclusions. So, so there's um, a great piece of psychology by Daniel Kahneman, a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which I highly recommend. Um, 
where he, he goes through this, you know, why over fast thinking or jumping to conclusions, as it's popularly known, um, is, is closely associated with bias, with making um, unnecessary or, or unhelpfully quick uh, conclusions. Now, obviously, it's okay asking people to slow down, and maybe if you're at Buddha Field, it's quite easy to slow down. Um, but if you're not, you know, if you're in the, working in the city or something, um, then you have, do have to make fast decisions. And uh, if there's a drowning child over there, then you do have to jump in and save them. But um, so the slowness applies where possible, not in every possible situation. Um, so that's why I've also put time framing next to that. Um, so provisionality does involve slowing down, making use of the time we have, rather than always being slow, because our decisions are also time framed by the circumstances. Um, so accepting that time framing is part of provisionality, part of understanding what it is to be provisional, I think. Um, but yeah, that's, that's um, a common instant objection I find if I start talking about provisionality. They say, well, yeah, but what about quick decision making? This, it, does, it doesn't really sound at all. But what it can do is, is if, we, uh, if we practice slowly, then we can uh, obviously be ready for when we need to make quick decisions. Um, now, I'm a, I'm a pianist, so I'm also uh, very aware of the value of slow practice to try and, you know, if you, if you need to speed up, um, be able to play something quickly, you'll have to start off slower in order to be able to do it. And, and again, the same applies to, to anything else, really. Um, OK, so uh, another aspect then of, of um, provisionality is slowness. Next around the clock, and I'll come back to the probabilizing in a minute, but next, next around the clock from slowness is synthesis. Um, so uh, provisionality involves making connections. Uh, so that's what I mean by, by synthesis, bringing together different ideas, considering them in relation to each other. Um, and it's only by making those connections that we can consider new possibilities. Um, Another way of thinking about that is creative, creative thought, creativity. So creativity occurs when two new ideas that you haven't connected before get connected in some way. Um, and uh, obviously you may then put those into action in, in art or in any other context. Um, so yeah, particularly you know, if there's a strong duality that you're working with, uh, you need to be able to imagine new possibilities, imagine new frameworks. and. Synthesis, I think, is really important for that. Not just accepting um, the, the uh, limitations of the way people are already thinking about an issue. And often, those limitations, I find, are created by over-specialization. So, so there's a lot of um, emphasis in our society on specialization. Um, and that can, can apply in lots of different ways, obviously, in terms of jobs and professions. Um, um, particularly highly skilled professions like uh, medicine or academia become highly specialised. Um, but even you know, an ordinary job, as it were, you, you're going to have some degree of specialisation in that, that job. But then there's also you know, things like gender specialisation or uh, specialisation in particular religious traditions. and you know, These can um, limit our ways of thinking. Um, so and obviously, uh, we can't avoid specialisation altogether. There are, you know, if we focus on particular things, we're going to get better at them and we're not so good at other things. But um, we can leave open more doors that are beyond our specialisation, if you like. Um, so that's where synthesis comes in, I think, as a quality of provisionality. Uh, and then further around, suppression. Now, it may surprise you to, to see that, but uh, I think it's very important to distinguish between suppression and repression. Okay, so often people use those two words interchangeably. I think psychologists are probably aware of the difference. But so suppression is where you focus your attention on something for the time being, and you don't focus on other things, and you're aware that that's what you're doing. 
So there's a, a context of awareness. Um, repression is where you're shutting things out and you don't realise you're doing that. So, so you are excluding possibilities there. But suppression, well, it's, it's a fact of our experience that uh, we have limited attention and we can only do one thing at a time quite often. Um, so to think provisionally, strangely enough, we need to be able to shut things out, but temporarily, whilst leaving some options open in the background. Um, so uh, I think being able to distinguish between suppression and repression, being able to focus our attention and put aside the mobile phone, for example, uh, even though there's, there might be a message, um, is, is a you know, vital part of provisionality. So, so um, it doesn't mean just reacting unreflectingly to every new stimulus. Okay, so then I'll come back over to the other side of the, the diagram, probabilizing. So this is about judging uh, in the best way. I think it's, it's the heart of um, trying to make our beliefs provisional, uh, responding to, to new information. So uh, probabilizing, well, well, see, uh, in the context of science, you'll hear a lot about probability uh, and scientists talking in terms of probabilities. Probabilizing as a, as a, a verb with an ing on it um, is a slightly wider idea. Uh, it's about the, um, the process of, of estimating how likely you are to be right about something. Yeah. So uh, thinking of it in terms of more or less, not this is true, I know this is true, and not on the other hand, or well, this is wrong, but okay, I've got a pretty strong justification for believing that, or I'm not really sure about that. It's pretty unlikely that that's correct. Yeah, uh, and we need those uh, kinds of judgments for practical purposes. Um, we do need to be able to um, to decide whether or not to accept what somebody's saying. Quite often, um, but we can do that on the basis of the weight of evidence about it, you know, what we think uh, is most likely based on the evidence so far. So probabilizing is thinking about how justified we are. You don't necessarily have to put a figure on it very formally. Obviously, if you are working in the context of, of formal science, then you will create formal probabilities and you'll have formal mechanisms for, for working those out. But for most of us, most of the time, it's a question of just thinking roughly how probable is this? Yeah. How, how likely is this? Um, based on what we're aware of. And um, that also means, um, I think, paying respect to very, very small or very large probabilities. So there are some things which are overwhelmingly likely. Okay? So it's overwhelmingly likely that I'm sitting here in a tent in Budafield. I'm not currently in a dome on Mars with an illusion surrounding me, okay, because I've got no evidence for the alternative view. Um, but I can't be absolutely certain about that, yeah, but it's so overwhelmingly probable that I am not going to make, you know, I'm not going to give any energy to the alternative scenario, yeah. Um, so um, when we get into um, conspiracy theories, which are, I think a major issue at the moment, um, that uh, we need to be able to try and weigh up how probable uh, this particular theory might be that we, we encounter um, in you know, looking at a range of evidence that might be relevant to it, um, not just a particularly narrow range of um, convincing arguments maybe that we may have encountered. So looking at it as broadly as possible, uh, probabilities may be very small or very large, it may be overwhelming, it may seem overwhelmingly obvious that we should think one way or another, and that's fine. But there's a difference between being a very small or very large probability and being absolutely certain. And I think that distinction is very important. We bear that distinction in mind. Um, okay, so when we've got different views of things, uh, we get to the final point on the right, weighing up. So judging comparative justification or credibility. Um, so uh, weighing up 
is, as I say, taking into account as much evidence, as much experience as we can from different sources in the situation, um, not just jumping to, to yes or no. Um, and that might apply to evidence, it might also apply to credibility. So, so there are a lot of things in this complex world that we can't directly understand or, or know much about. Um, so theoretical physics, for example, you know, I'm pretty ignorant of. Um, or uh, anything involving specialised expertise is very likely to be in that category. Um, so then in that kind of situation where we don't have um, much evidence that we can maybe understand or, or engage with, we have to rely on credibility. We have to rely on the sources, the, you know, trusting one source or another source. You know, and that applies very much to political issues. You know, do you trust the BBC, etc. Um, so uh, there I think it's very important to weigh up the credibility of different sources, particularly when they say different things. Um, so we don't just think, oh, that's the source I believe in, so let's believe everything that source says and dismiss the other sources, but look at the other sources as well and think about how likely they are to be correct. You know, for example, um, what's their reputation? Uh, how much expertise do they have? Um, are they obviously biased? Uh, you know, do, they, do they have... Uh, a past record of being so. So if we, then, if we go through a weighing up process, I think we can avoid a lot of the unnecessary um, conflicts that we may get into, uh, which come from not being provisional, from, from assuming that we have an absolute view of things. Okay, so, so that's just um, a quick look around what I think provisionality is what well, involves, but I'm now going to talk a little bit about uh, how to be provisional, so about the practice of provisionality, which is obviously what it's all about really. Um, so I'm going to se uh, separate uh, those practices into background and foreground. So if you want to be provisional, there's a long-term aspect to this, uh, and there's a, a short-term. So the what I call the background practices of the long term. How can you cultivate the sorts of mental states or approaches that help you to be provisional in the long term? Um, <clears throat> but then the foreground practices are how can I be provisional now when I'm making this judgment here? So the background practices um, are things uh, which uh, you, you might find uh, widely practiced in Buddhist movements like Triratna perhaps, but also in the education system, so at least in certain places, um, and obviously in lots of other places. So um, mindfulness I'm starting with, um, but including in mindfulness I mean not just meditation but also body work kind of practices um, that help us to avoid stress responses basically. So, so if we're uh, aware of our bodies and relaxed in our bodies we're much less likely to start jumping to conclusions because us jumping to conclusions is related to stress responses, to feeling yes I've got to fit in with my group here because otherwise I might be threatened here. Um, so mindfulness can be really helpful to cultivating provisionality but it's probably not enough by itself. I'm also suggesting academic reading and writing, um, whatever that means uh, for you in your context, yes, yeah? so, so moving on from whatever starting point you have educationally. Um, but any, any way you can engage with more challenging thinking, um, whether you're producing it or, or reading it, um, might help your capacity for slow reflection and thinking about alternative ways of looking at things. And then the arts. So all the arts, I think, help us in one way or another to develop our imaginative capacities to consider alternatives. So they open doors, they open windows. Um, even if we're reading something that's entirely fantastic, for example, or we're um, engaging in um, 
creating an artwork that's, that's uh, completely removed in its theme from what we see around us. We're, we're exploring possibilities and it's, it's often very difficult to track exactly how those possibilities might affect us, but I do think they have a practical effect on our decision making, and our judgment in the long term. They open new opportunities, new ways of, possible ways of thinking. Um, and then finally, critical thinking. Um, so that can be a, a practice in itself, it can be taught in itself. So I've spent some time personally teaching critical thinking in a sixth form college. Um, while it was still available as an A-level, which it isn't anymore, but um, critical thinking is a discipline which you can learn um, separately from any particular academic study. Uh, but uh, it's also often absorbed to some extent when you, you study something else. Um, so critical thinking is, is careful judgment, I think, about how we justify our beliefs. Um, and uh, so provisionality is really central, I think, to critical thinking skills. Okay, so those are, those are things in the background. If you do those sorts of things generally, those are likely to help you to be more provisional. But again, they're not a silver bullet. They don't necessarily always help you to be provisional in a particular situation. If you bring them all together, I think that will help more. Um, so it's a question of interaction and interdependence between practices rather than just finding one magic practice and thinking this is the solution to everything. Um, and then the foreground practices, so, so uh, when we're actually in the moment, when we're actually thinking, well, what do I decide about this? Um, so there's, there's a list of points that I'd like to consider and some of these um, I will be exploring more in the workshop here, yeah? so, so I'll be uh, asking you to uh, try and apply these in the workshop. Um, so consider alternative options. Uh, so when you're confronted by binaries particularly, uh, which may be you know, strongly opposed views held by two different groups, um, or particularly where people are insisting, yeah, there's only two ways of looking at this, you've got to take a choice, it's one or the other, um, then Consider the alternatives. Um, consider both long and short term needs. So if you think about the uh, problems with people's thinking about global warming, it's often not, be, not about, think, about thinking short term, isn't it? It's not about thinking long term enough and people's difficulty in engaging with the long enough term. Um, just occasionally, though, people do think long term and need to think short term instead, um, which uh, but that's a less common problem, perhaps. Um, so these are all reflections you can apply if you have a kind of mental checklist. Uh, am I thinking about alternative options here? Am I thinking both long term and short term? Um, third point, consider complexity beyond your current beliefs or your current awareness. Um, so it just it may be more complex than that. Um, uh, or it's, um, so if you've got somebody, for example, who gives you uh, a complex explanation that you don't really understand or relate to, well, that may be because they understand some sort of complexity that you haven't got, got a handle on yet. Um, of course, it may not. It may all be waffle. That's another possibility. You just have to make the best judgment you can. Um, then um, building resilience. So I talked about adaptivity and resilience. Um, so resilience in judgment um, is, is um, obviously trying to uh, not be knocked sideways by your experience, particularly a powerful emotional experience. Uh, you've just had an argument with somebody or you've just seen something you hate on the internet or whatever it is. Um, so things like mindfulness can really help with that, with, with um, maintaining your equanimity, not having your judgment diverted. Um, but building resilience is obviously also important ecologically. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I'm currently engaged in trying to create a forest garden in this, this uh, 
place we've brought in Wales that we're trying to turn into a retreat centre. Um, and that for me is very much about resilience, um, thinking about how not only us, but also our environment, which then affects us, can be resilient, how, how we can um, uh, yeah, maintain uh, a system that's adapted to new conditions, that, that has um, its, its own uh, set of relationships that will conti likely continue in some form, regardless of new events. Um, so I think there's a close relationship between our resilience in the way we judge things and the resilience uh, that we create in our environment or help to create in our environment. Um, okay, the next point is slow down. So I've mentioned the value of slowness. So that's quite a simple thing. Uh, we've already got that in popular awareness perhaps. Count to 10, you know, before you explode. Um, that's provisionality, isn't it? Simple thing. Um, uh, look for intuitions and rational considerations. So uh, another way that people could specialise and get a bit stuck is if they're only in one of those modes and not the other. So uh, people can be, for example, very intuitive in their responses to things and believe in their intuitions. And then if somebody tries to give them an argument where everything's laid out and there's the evidence, that doesn't really mean much to them. Or you can get, on the other hand, you can get someone who's got everything laid down, it's very, maybe very clearly argued, but there are actually certain assumptions in there which may, not, may or may not be correct. Um, maybe an intuitive view can actually help them stand back a bit and see a bigger picture, which they wouldn't otherwise be aware of. Um, so, Intuition and, and reason, if you like, are both um, things we need, I think, to, to take into account and use. Neither of them gives us magic answers. They need to work to, together. Um, thinking beyond your specialisations. So that's, again, another thing you can consciously reflect on. So am I just being the person I was trained to be in my profession, say, or in my degree course if I did one or something like that um, or am I considering other ways of looking at things here um, um, prioritizing your attention so if you don't actually focus on the issue it's difficult to be provisional so put your mobile phone away um, probabilize so I've already mentioned that don't assume you've got the facts in an absolute sense even though there may be overwhelming evidence for one way one view or the other um, and, uh, but respect asymptotes, so, so um, asymptotes is a, it's a mathematical term for, if you look at it, if you have a graph uh, which is tracking a particular quality and it, um, the tail of the graph, as it were, brushes the bottom of the graph, so it almost it records almost, almost, almost zero or almost, almost 100% at the top. That's, what, that's an asymptote, yeah. So, so an asymptote is something that's uh, a belief we may hold, in this case, that is um, overwhelmingly likely, and we can respect that, but it's still not a certainty. Um, and then finally, aspect of practice, way up. Um, so, uh, and that involves not accepting authorities Absolutely. Even if there are some sources we respect and think are really reliable, that's not quite the same as them being absolutely correct. Um, okay, so, so um, as I say, I'm going to go more into this uh, as a practice and get you doing it in the workshop this afternoon if you want to come along to that. Um, and I've given some, uh, a link at the bottom there if you want to explore any of this further. That web address, you'll find some videos which explore provisionality and the, and the other principles of the middle way. Um, and I have a book coming out next year which includes a large section on provisionality as, as one of the five principles of the middle way, uh, along with the other ones I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, um, 
and um, yeah, if, if there's also some of my recent books here, so if you want to look at those uh, at the end of the session, then feel free. So I'm going to stop uh, speaking there, but I'm very open to questions. Has anyone got any questions or responses or thoughts?